Talking Talking back. Back. Welcome to Decision, Decision Space, Space, the only show to take place right here, here, in the space between the turns in your favorite games. I'm Jake Friedman. And I'm Brennan Hansen. And this is the podcast about decisions in games. And on today's episode, we're talking our geek way to the West experience. We're going to f- talk in the first half of the episode about the many, many games we played, give you a quick rundown of what it was like for Jake and I to meet in person after all these years, talk about some of the decision knots who showed up and played over 20 games with us. But then... We're going to pivot and kind of just talk about large group games. So we'll talk about Blood on the Clock Tower, Challengers, a game we played with eight that was recently nominated for the Kinnerspiel DRs, and Guards of Atlantis 2, a game that's going crazy right now with another game found crowdsourcing campaign that's a MOBA that Jake and I, I don't think we expected to play, but we did. So we want to give some more room for those coverage of those games to really breathe. Yeah. And then a lot of the other games we covered, I think what you're trying to say is that the ones we touch on briefly here, there'll still be opportunities in future episodes where we can go a bit deeper in our experiences with them. Um, But Brendan, before we talk about the games Mm -hmm. we played, maybe we should talk about what it was like for us to meet in person for the very first time after over two years of creating this podcast together. Yeah, it's wild. This is episode 122 of Decision Space, right? Or is it episode 121? It's 121 or Don't 122. Don't ask me that. That's not yeah, my that's department. A, that's a question for me. <laughs> um, it's 121 or 122. But regardless, 120 episodes over two years of our life collaborating on a show, having never met in person. I would say meeting in person, meeting Jake, far exceeded my expectations in every way, shape, and form. Jake was an incredible host. That's good. That means my strategy of keeping expectations low was successful. You succeeded. You succeeded. Well played. (laughs) No, no, no. My expectations were high, and you guys... uh, you guys crushed them. Jake and Bridget opened their home to me, and it was lovely. I also say, Jake, you know, there was a latent fear. What if Jake was terrible to play games with on the table or something? <laughs> right. But yeah. it did not turn. It was great. Yeah, totally. I felt really comfortable we were going to have good magic circle gaming yeah. chemistry, which you don't always sign, but I think just because of the way we think about games being so on the same page, that wasn't my fear at all. But yeah, it was fantastic. Brenda, you were a great house guest. I just want to shout out to my wife, Bridget, one more time for helping hosting. out, hosting so much and Playing giving rock. us space to play like over 30 hours of games uh, I was over thinking about a it. couple days. I think in two and a half days, we played 35 hours of games. It was a lot. I still, you know, did you do you feel like you got like a con hangover? Because <laughs> I feel like I'm still tired. Yeah, I a little bit. I feel like I have so much excitement. It was like such a game dense time. But yeah, the sleep is something I'm catching up on still. Yeah, there, I, I feel that. And then also, it's just kind of the thing when it's like once the con is over and you're sitting there and I'm and you're like, damn. It's a whole year before Geekway to the West. <laughs> yes, again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you and some of the other folks, uh, some of the other decision odds, actually some of those who came to the show, uh, we're talking about other conventions you might want to go to already. Your your appetites have been uh, increased based on how awesome it was. I'll also say, Jake, it was incredible meeting you. Uh, we, I feel like we work so well together in our regular life that it was just like hanging out with a friend I hadn't seen in years, except one who I talked to every all the time online like it it just didn't feel like we were meeting for the first time to me yeah i we talked about this a little bit in person but we should also just give a huge shout out to all the people in this community that came out to play games with us in person uh it was just awesome and i think one revelation for me is obviously you're online we're online friends with all these people we hang out in our discord talk to them daily play games with them daily and that relationship really works but i think i discounted how much that would mean that when we met in person it would just feel like hanging out with friends like i felt like i already knew people's personalities knew who they were uh you know and, and to a person everybody who came out was just awesome so much fun gaming with them so just a huge thanks again to those folks who who came out it was so cool i was really impressed by how well so many people in the group were like checking in with each other making sure everyone is having fun trying to make sure everyone is engaged in a game taking turns learning games pitching in bringing games it was awesome many of you we've said thanks to already so i don't know that we will 
we'll say that on the show even more because there's lots of people listening uh, who obviously weren't there. But needless to say, the decision space community was wonderful. And thank you so much to all of you. So Jake, the big question on everyone's mind, <laughs> how many games did we get played overall and played out of our list of aspirational games that we talked about in last episode, our mission planning episode? So in our mission planning episode, we talked about the games we wanted to play, and I kind of counted up at the end how many we covered. And I think I said 18 on that show, but then when I looked at the list again, it was actually 20. And of wow. those 20 games that we talked about wanting to play either together or at the con, we managed to play a whopping 13 of them, which I think, you know, that's worth a pat on the back. Yeah, pretty awesome. Patting myself as well. And then overall, we'll get into this in a, in a minute. First, we'll talk about the games that we played that we aspired to play. Uh, but overall, between Jake and I, we played 25 different or 25 titles total between the two of us. It's a lot of games. It's a lot. And, and we got into some like, as you'll hear, some like chunkier, meatier, heavier games too. We, we really played a lot of more challenging ones to get to the table. Uh, and I was so thankful for those experiences. So for everybody who's interested on like who won our little gamble, me obviously jake was right we covered more it, unless more we unless we were going by prices right rules in which case i went over by one in that case we're going by prices right rules <laughs> <laughs> jake what do you say when we run down this list we're obviously not gonna be able to spend too much time with any of them we try to say what one of the coolest decisions was in the game even if it doesn't it's not a game that has lasting appeal for us okay really high level overview so, for example, one of the first games we played at the con was Bamboo, uh, a game that Jake was really excited to play that's a spatial puzzle Euro game with lots of different mechanisms going on. I would say it's sort of this like kitchen sink style game that tries to pack a lot into a small package. It's from Devere Games, who published Batoku last year. They also did the presentation. They published Millefiori the Kinesia game with beautiful presentation. And at its heart is this spatial puzzle where you're trying to have balance on the tiles you add to the left side of your home and the right. This game did not hit for me. I would say pass on bamboo, but the coolest decision was that spatial puzzle of trying to create balance. And I would be really interested to see a game in the future explore that puzzle more without maybe a lot of the other things bolted on that kind of bloated the experience. We played this with two tables all playing it so we had like you know side by side experience with almost all the decision odds there and I, I would say out of everyone who played it uh only one person seemed like they really liked it and the majority of people thought it was kind of fine i don't think people were like strongly anti this game in general but i was underwhelmed by it it did not like meet my high expectations for how cool it looked and at the end of the day it just felt like a really puzzly game the closest comparison i can think of is azul queen's garden which is a puzzle that i enjoyed just a bit more so i wouldn't be picking this one up yeah. And in my mind, it's almost like it's nowhere near at this level, but it has a, some of the like lots of different mechanisms going on of living forest. And then the puzzle at its heart is reminiscent, but not quite as strong as Calico. So it's like a mashup of those two, but kind of worse in every way than either. Nice. We're taking too long already, but let's go to our next game, which is Findorf. This was the Freedom and Frieza game that I was really eager to try that has a power grid style market. Um, but besides that, it's a very different game of engine building where you have a rondelle of just four simple actions. You're increasing the efficiency of those actions. You're buying more uh, production tiles. And it's all about trying to pay the cost to build these structures. You're starting with a hand of these structure cards. And then there's uh, some additional ones in the market. Uh, and it's all about racing to build as many of those as you can because they're worth a whopping 50 points at the end of the game. Brendan, what did you think of Findorf? So Findorf was awesome. It was shockingly thematic for what appears to be a dry Euro game because it's about building the city. Uh, it actually, Jake and I were joking that it's almost like architects of the Findorf kingdom because the whole game, you, you get dealt this hand of building cards that will represent a huge footprint of your potential score that you're working to build as efficiently as possible. And you're also racing to complete some shared cards. This game really impressed me. We'll probably cover it in a future episode as well, maybe talking about Rondell games. I will say I'm not confident that this would be a 20, 30 play or even a 15 play game for me. Uh, I really liked my one play. I could see playing it a few more times and kind of getting the full experience. 
but yeah, awesome. Definitely recommend Findorf. Yeah, I loved it. Uh, and I played it twice. The first play, I was like, this is very cool. It played way faster than I thought. I think we've got it done with the teach and a five player game in 90 minutes. Yep. The second game, uh, like knowing, internalizing the rules a bit more, it really popped for me. Um, I, I loved it. Plays as fast as I was hoping it would and or even faster. And yeah, so one of the plays of the con for me, for sure. I actually bought a copy of this game. Nice. It whips around the table. Yeah, I will say that. This next game is Challengers, which we're going to talk about at the end of the episode. So you're going to have to wait, but I'll wait your appetite. This is a very, very <laughs> unique experience. Okay, great. Uh, one that I had on my list of something I was really eager to try. I want to shout out to Joe Carcassonne Hater in the Discord who hauled Millennial Blades all the way to St. Louis from San Francisco so we could get it to the table. Um, I would describe, if, if you don't know about Millennium Blades, it's essentially a collectible card game tournament competitive simulator in a box uh, that plays out over two phases. One phase where you're collecting cards for your your collection and building decks and then a phase where you use the deck that you've built in kind of a tableau building style tournament what i would say about millennium blades is i love everything about this game except for the gameplay the theme of the game fantastic the ambition of the game incredible the amount of content you get in the box like so many level 99 games it feels like a toy that you can really cultivate whatever experience you want out of it very easily just because you have so many toys to play with um the gameplay fell re- fell pretty flat for me, I have to be honest. The biggest issue I had with it was the deck construction and collection building phase is real time and it plays out over 20 minutes. I felt like I was done with that aspect of the game after like a maybe seven minutes in, in both phases, which means that's, you know, 30 minutes of sitting there looking at my phone with nothing to do, which is, you know unacceptable maybe i was doing something wrong but then i ended up winning the game so that was just really strange and maybe that's the only time i would ever have that experience with it but it's probably the only time i'll play the game too um so yeah awesome object as like a piece of art in the board game space i'm so happy i had the experience to interact with it once but i will not be seeking out additional plays of millennium blade from the episode title, obviously we played Blood on the Clock Tower. Excited to talk about that one in the back half of the episode. Spooky game. We, I also, Jake did not <laughs> participate in this game with me, but thanks to Jared, J Red Eye in the Discord, we got to play a ton of Kinesia games. One of those games was very high on the list of games I want to try, and that is Samurai. Uh, Samurai is a tile lane game by Kinesia that's maybe perfect at three based on a really neat scoring mechanism. You're spending the game trying to collect these three types of resources and to qualify for winning the game, you have to have the most of one of them. If you do, your score is the other two of the resources combined. So what this means is you want to have a balance of all three resources as equally as possible while still having the most in one. That made for a fascinating play experience. This is the first Kinesia game that I've played where the tiles have values on them, which meant that you really cared about when certain tiles came out and where. It also scaled by player count, something some of his other tile lane games don't do all that well. Babylonia does, Samurai does. This was fantastic. I loved my play. It was decided by one resource that was collected, so a very close game. And I'd be thrilled to play it again. Some really novel little twists. Uh, with the tiles that made this one interesting, engaging, and nuanced, and made me feel like there's room in a collection for this and a lot of the other tiling games that it inspired. I was sitting next to you as you played this, and the board presence of it is awesome. It looks so cool and striking compared to others in the Kinesia tile placement collection of games. This was the uh, Fantasy Flight version of the game that has beautiful cast, like 3D pieces for yeah, the resources. We love minis De- on Decision Space. We're <laughs> pro mini, uh, as you'll hear. <laughs> Next up was Imperial 2030, another one that I was dying to try. I uh, picked up a copy of this game, Ding and Dent, and have been staring at it, waiting for it to get to the table for some months now. Uh, in Imperial 2030, it is a risk looking game. But instead of playing as the country, you're playing as the a, a seedy capitalist pulling the strings of the world. So if you're the person who is most invested in a country, you will get to choose what that country does on their turn rather than 
on your turn as a player. There are no player turns. There are just country turns. So it's possible that one player could control multiple countries where another player at the table controls zero countries. Uh, We played this game at six players, meaning everybody started with one country. And I think that was not the optimal player count because it made it more difficult for positions financial positions and investments in countries to change so it wasn't really until the very late game that ownership of countries really started changing hands where if you were playing at less than six the game would be starting in a place where investing in a new country would be much easier to gain a variable kind of setup of control which i think would be a lot more interesting i found this game fascinating to play i loved the first two hours of the game our play ran about three hours and the last hour really dragged for me so i will be excited to play this game again at four or maybe five or maybe three i think four is the number i really want to shoot for um and it's probably a one more play game for me i think it might really pop at four and then be something that i'll want to keep playing but this was just a so so experience because of the dragging at the end and i really was taken aback by imperial 2030 and its systems the rules fit on a very small piece of paper though there are some edge case rules that you need to be aware of uh this one i would love to play again and one will likely cover in another episode there's a lot of interesting things that come out of this being a rondelle driven game and consequences to the decisions there that we'd love more space to explore so maybe look for a rondelle episode on where we'll go in depth on Findorf and Imperial 2030. The next game we played was we took a, a little, you know, we played Imperial 2030 actually. And then the next, literally the next game Jake and I played with a, a couple other folks was My City Roll and Write. Jake and I are obviously huge fans of My City. My City Roll and Write was clever. It was cute. And it brought not a ton new to the table from the little bit that we examined and saw, but a really faithful adaptation of the tiling game in dice form. And it changes the puzzle as it, because it adds a little bit more uncertainty. This is not one I'll pick up new. If I saw it uh, for on sale for a little bit cheaper, I wouldn't hesitate to snag it and play some games. Really neat little game. I was a bit underwhelmed by it too, but it's difficult to judge since we just played one random yep. episode. Like we played like the third game out of... 12 or however many is in this little campaign um so so one of the earlier ones so maybe just because of our experience with my city and and it just didn't really pop but it was cool it was a fun palette cleanser but yeah again i'm with you i'm not gonna rush out and buy a copy right away next up on the list was a game we played our first night when you came into town we checked out the pokemon trading card game so as we talked in our planning episode you you bought a couple of championship level decks um and we played them against each other and holy cow this was a strange game i think my biggest takeaway uh, was just that this game is unlike anything that really fits into the modern board gaming hobby it just feels like such a unique separate thing which makes sense because you don't hear about people in the board game space talking about pokemon or Oh or games like that that much they really feel like their own thing unto itself i had an awesome time checking it out and playing it with you i think maybe we, we set aside that for a future conversation on on tcgs um, but yeah what a weird introduction to a strange game yeah tutor effects and draw effects galore another game i got to play which i was really thrilled about was a game in my top 10 monolith arena this is a tile laying area like hex based combat game for two played this with richard and i had a great time i it made me realize though jake we didn't get to play it together which was lamentable maybe for the future but one thing about conventions is two player games in a convention environment if you're there with a larger group can be a little bit of a tougher sell i think it's hard to justify a little bit of side time and i think while we were playing this is a puzzly little game that requires a lot of focus uh, and i think I, I was feeling like oh I really want to play Monolith, but maybe this isn't the right setting for it. Um, So that was a a nice little lesson learned uh, about myself and my taste. Also, we had a unique position in that we were really trying to play games with people from the Discord, where if we had just showed up at a random con as just 
the two attendees. of us. Like, like I've gone to cons with my wife and we just played two player games the whole time and it's awesome, you know? Yeah, so totally. we just had a unique dynamic that we were there as much for them as we were for the games. Yeah. We also, Jake and I snuck in a game of Soul Forge Fusion, a game Jake has talked about on the podcast before. This is the Richard Garfield uh, deck building deck evolution game uh that's kind of a follow-up on the keyforge system because all the decks are procedurally generated i thought this game was fascinating i'm not super interested in playing it again to me it feels like it was a digital designed to be a digital game prototyped on paper and then it wasn't printed digitally but instead printed on paper there's a lot of upkeep and a lot of automated actions that feel like they'd be a slam dunk in digital that in paper or a little fiddly. It was really cool to see some of the mechanisms, uh, but I feel like I got as much as I want out of that experience after one play. Yeah, I I agree with you. Out of the collectible dueling card games I have at my fingertips, I don't think Soul Forge Fusion is ultimately one that I want to like continue spending a ton of time with, but it's fun to show to people just as such an interesting thing. The first game Jake and I played together, we also played with Bridget, and that was Raw. We played on Jake's deluxe 25th century games version, which is just gorgeous, way overproduced with beautiful wood tiles, thick tokens made of chunky wood as well, and some metal coins, all in a box that's probably a little too big for the game it contains. But despite that, the game is so wonderful, it justifies it better than almost any other game might. I was looking at some versions of on the secondary market of this deluxe version just because it's so beautiful i loved raw jake thank you for showing it to me i want to play this game more the mechanism of uh you are bidding and set domination denominations of money but also bidding on future money that you'll use when you're bidding on tiles it's just so such a perfect twist and it feels like a game that's just resolute and interesting and it deserves more of a conversation Every play I've had of that copy that I got has been fun. So it just feels like it's deserving that <laughs> treatment that it got more and more. You know, yep. I think I had it my third favorite game and it's just another awesome play of it. So stick in there for now. We then played Babylonia, Brendan's favorite game of all time. This was such a special play for me because uh, after meeting my wife for lunch, we played Babylonia. We also played with Beer for Dad on the Discord. It was so fun to play this game. Brendan taught it to me. The thing about Raw, and I think Babylonia too, is when you play a legendary design by Reiner Knizia, a legendary designer, they almost always feel like they're both less and more than what you think. You know, it's Babylonia is such a slight game. You know, the rules teach was simple. We learned and played it and set it up and tore it down in under an hour i'm sure it was really fun i smoked everyone at it so that made it pretty cool uh i don't know i don't know what else to say about it you know i don't know that it was my favorite play of the whole convention but it was definitely good enough that i would be eager to play it again and i think that's kind of the way that these games go is it's like at the end of the play you're like i'd play that again and then I'd play that again, and then slowly but surely it it keeps creeping up on you. And I, I could see that happening for me as well as it's happened for you. So those were the 13 games that we covered from our list. Uh, I will say, Jake, congratulations on being correct. Um, I have some other numbers that I want to mention that might be of interest to people. We played eight Kinesia games. Uh, so among that list, Modern Art, which Jake actually played on Real Paintings, Babylonia, Ross, and Samurai, which we've already mentioned, Tower of Babel, I got a play of this game in. It was fascinating. Not going to go more in depth than it here, but if you've heard Whispers of Hype, I come down on the side of, this is a neat one, you should check it out. We just played Rapido, Escalation, and then of course My City Roll and Write, which we mentioned. Jake, you know, there's a, we covered a lot of Kinesia games this year. Yeah. At some point, I think there's probably room for us to do a little, little, little checkup with the doctor, talk about some of these games, maybe slightly more in depth, and just our thoughts Definitely. overall on where we're at. Uh, so now that I, oh, we also played two plays of Zuvatis, the new game from Bitewing Games. That's an update of Quo Vadis, uh, rethemed with animals, and I would say. Really, it's a it's a new game. They've added unique player powers. They've added new mechanisms with these neutral peacocks that you can move. I haven't played the original, but I've I've seen the changes, and they're they're pretty robust and give you a lot more room to work. This game, we'll talk about if we do one of those follow up episodes some more. But I will say, phenomenal experience with zany outcomes. These two plays were some of the most memorable of the convention for me. 
for sure. This game is insane. A very, very crazy experience. Fun, but also frustrating. Uh, Yeah, I think we need to talk about this more in depth in another episode because we're already running long. I think so too. Let's save it. Okay, so we played eight new releases, five card games, all of which we've mentioned, except we also played Mindbug, kind of an interesting little game. Four games released before the year 2000, including T-Call, which was one of two Keesling games we played. Jake also played Heaven and Ale. I think, you know, in the same way we we probably want to do a checkup with the doctor, probably time for us to do an episode on Keesling games and Kramer and Keith slash and Keesling games. At some point on the show, we've both played quite a few of them now. I'm really interested based on the to call play to play Cuzco and Mexico. Uh, I've been looking to pick those up on the secondary, and I think they deserve more of an exploration. But to call Jake, that for me, I'm going to say, if it's not my play of the con, it's close. I loved that experience, and I'm looking forward to talking about it more on the show. Yeah, absolutely. We also played three Rondell games, Imperial 2030, Findorf, Heaven and Ale, one Dexterity game, Crokinole. We played Hansa Teutonica, which deserves its own mention because it's like everybody's favorite game of all time, apparently. That was pretty funny. I told everyone that action upgrades is too powerful. Nobody believed me. I went for the action upgrades, smoked everyone. Uh, so doubling down on that take. And then lastly, we there was Brendan's game, Unrest, coming out soon by Pandasaurus, was there in prototype form. People were playing it all over the place. Jan- I got to play it as the Empire side. Had a blast. Uh, came down to the last turn. I lost, so I don't know. Maybe I'll go rate this a five or something on Board Game Geek now. Uh, if I had won, it would have been a 10, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, it was cool just for me on the side to see people playing this and giving you feedback. And it really seemed like people were genuinely having a great time with it. Yeah, it was awesome getting to see people play play and rest and a, a taste of what's to come. I have so much pent-up excitement for that to get out into the world. And I was really humbled at the reaction some people's, people were having and the comparisons uh, some folks were making. Charlie, one of our decision knots, was saying that uh, it reminded him a little bit of Battleline meets Netrunner, which... You know, if, if folks want to compare my games to Battleline or Netrunner, a Richard Garfield game or a Kinesia <laughs> game, I'm going to be humbled and gracious. So thank you so much for all of you who played it. Jake, yeah, also, it was also inspiring to me, like made me want to be like, I need to like get cracking on some of my prototypes, nice. you know? That's awesome. I actually, I had the same experience in, about making some new games just based on all the games we played. I want to mention Hansa though. So I think the audience might be curious to hear my thoughts and impression. You had played it and said, you know, I like it. I think it's fine. I don't think it's the best Euro game of all time. You've played it three times now. Interestingly, I was really excited for this one. You know, it's a route building game in a lot of ways. And I really love route building games. But Hansa did not hit for me in the way that it hits seemingly for everyone. Uh, I found the game a little bit plodding. Uh, and I I really felt like it was just the, the first quarter could have been cut from that game. And it would have been so much more energetic and exciting. I love the interaction. The downside of the interaction is it makes the planning really difficult. The upside of that is it makes the game tactical. It makes you be flexible with your plans. For me, the, the biggest issue was I didn't feel the game typically built to exciting moments. Because it was so plotting, the game felt fairly samey all the way through, despite players being able to do tons more by the end of the game because of the upgrades. So Hansa was great. I'm glad I played it. I, will, I would never ask to play Hansa again. If people were playing, I would likely agree if it was the first game of the night if it was the last game of the night i might opt to bow out wow hans a hater yeah. wow get him the hater hat this is <laughs> big news uh yeah it was fun it was funny like playing this next to you because you were leaning over to me and be like why don't we just start with three actions or, you know, so you kind of designed the Hansa prelude expansion where everybody just starts with one level of upgrade in every space, which should be interesting. Speed it up a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Hansa two Tonica. (laughs) Uh, Anyway, but it appeals to so many people love that game. And obviously right now in the discord, everybody's saying like the top like if they could only have 10 games in their collection and everybody has Hansa Teutonica in their collection of yeah, 10 yeah. games. <laughs> I'm an outlier here. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, yeah. This is how, so this is how you But you and me Pea both, Flower. you know? But yeah, yeah I, I, I'm shocked that you were lower on that than me. I thought just knowing what I know about you, I thought that was going to be a smash hit for you. Uh, but interesting that it wasn't. Yeah. So 
Brendan, let's end this part of the episode with the play of the convention for each of us. You go first. I honestly think for me, the play of the convention is, <laughs> this is so hard. Oh my gosh. The most memorable plays I had were Zuvatis. The most intriguing play I had was Samurai. And the game I most made me, that I can't stop thinking about is to call. Okay, but what was your play of the convention? A single uh, play. Why are you going to make me do that? Because um, you wrote these notes. I'm just yeah. reading your question that you wrote on the, you know, the note. I'm going to go with challengers, actually. And we'll talk about it more in the second half of the show. Awesome. I'm also going to go with challengers. How about that? We Let's synced up it. on our play of the convention. Uh, my honorary mention might be that play of Keyforge. And then that yeah. second play of Findor, if I had, where everything was popping. Um, but yeah, going with challengers, too. All right. Join us on the other side as we break down big player count games, large player count games that we played at this convention. All right, Brendan. First up for large player count games that we played, Blood on the Clock Tower. Let's talk about it. So Blood on the Clock Tower is a social deduction game built on games like Mafia, Werewolf, and The Resistance. Blood on the Clock Tower has this massive reputation as this sort of grail game, this amazing game that creates experiences like no other experience in that genre or maybe in board games broadly. I will say the thing that there's two major things that distinguishes it from some of those other games. One, uh, there's a ton of different roles in this game, some of which you know will always be in the game and some of which many of which it's just left up to question whether or not people playing the game have one of those roles. This means that players are provided with a rich decision space and play space to create alibis and sow stories and, and build narrative upon. And then what supports this is there's this mechanism where there's always a drunk. And the this mechanism is so important to Blood on the Clock Tower because it dictates how information flows in the game and it creates an air of uncertainty. The player who is the drunk true thinks and believes because they are told by the moderator, which Blood on the Clock Tower needs to run and work successfully, that they are a certain character. But they are not that character. They are provided with all the information as if they were that character, but that information will not be correct. This means that they can make claims they can assert truths that they fully believe. They are not acting. They truly believe they are given character. Uh, it's always maybe in the back of their head and everyone at the in the game that they might be the drunk. Uh, you just so, know anybody who says anything about anything. their role, it's possible they could be the drunk. So it's like sort of this penumbra of like misinformation that just clouds all conversations because you kind of have to end be like, unless I'm the drunk, in which case this is all wrong. Which is really interesting because it makes it a game about tugging on strings of information, trying to suss out what might be right. Uh, every night, like in, in a game of Mafia, uh, the evil player, the imp, the main evil player that you're trying to cast out of your town, is going to kill one of the villagers. So if you provide too much information, you show your hand that you are a good person because they don't even have information of everyone who's on their team. You, know, you put a target on your back. But at the same time, if you don't fess up, you don't share, uh, you're, there's not going to be enough information to solve that problem. And I found the core tension of the game really impressive. Uh, there was this driving sense of we have to make a decision that compelled you to converse uh, and, and to squeeze into conversations. And also because of the size, it's one of the first social deduction games that I've played where you were really encouraged to have side conversations. I walked away from the group a couple of times to talk to people, which was fun and interesting. And then kind of felt like, am I being pulled away from the group to like be spun a lie away from other people such that I'm going to be shivved for trusting? I don't think it was because of the larger player count. I mean, we only played this with eight or nine people. Yeah. So I've played games of the resistance with that many players and and it doesn't lead to side conversation. I think it has to do more with the special roles that you have, where if you're somebody who has a lot of information, important information as the town folk, you might, maybe somebody around the table has convinced you that they're definitely on the good side so you're willing to share your information with them but you don't want to reveal that you're this i think what the fortune teller was a character that potentially could have really valuable information to everyone but you don't want to necessarily reveal that you're the but their information gets better the more nights they survive and you don't want to reveal that you're the fortune teller early on so you don't want to so we had this experience where the first time we played this game just trying to like 
understand how to play this as a town folk i had this brilliant idea where it's like let's just all go around the table and say what our role is thinking that that's going to make the evil people really uncomfortable and, and force them to lie which if i was on the evil team that would make me uncomfortable so i said my role honestly we started going around and then we got to jared and he's like i don't feel comfortable sharing my role so you're just gonna have to trust me that i'm a good person and it ended up being that he was the fortune teller. And because that's such a high value position, he didn't want to put that target on his back. But then it ended up making everybody suspicious of him because he wouldn't share his role. So that type of thing really fascinated. It just gives you more more threads to pull to suss out and deduce who's good and who's not. Yeah. Jake and I are both really big fans of the resistance and maybe have the unpopular or uncommon opinion that base resistance is like almost as good as it gets that even adding the extra layer of Avalon maybe detracts a little bit from the potential for the heart of social deduction games, right? Looking at deeply into the eyes of your opponent, of your friends, the people you're sharing the table with and seeing, trying to tell if they're someone you can trust or not. Uh, that maybe even those extra mechanisms get in the way. So Blood on the Clock Tower is really taking that core and bolting a ton of more stuff onto it. I will say this game, uh, it seems like it's really tough to run this game well. There's a lot of moving pieces. There's a lot of things going on. And I think that Blood on the Clock Tower does a really good job of being a unique game experience that for fans of the social deduction genre is like this incredible opus that's like a love letter to all of these games that breaks new ground. But it's definitely for fans of the genre, right? The people I want to play Blood on the Clock Tower with are the people who I've played the Resistance with in a group of like eight or nine or 10 people 20 times. And then I want us to really sink our teeth into Blood on the Clock Tower. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I love that this is a heavier social deduction game. I think that's something that definitely has space in the market. And I like this more than a heavy complicated board game that has social deduction thrown onto it like something like nemesis right where it's like or a dead of winter where it's sort of like oh but maybe somebody's working against us like this is a pure social deduction game that has weight through roles and that was cool and to your point about enjoying the pure social deduction game one thing i liked about this experience was uh how much that looking at people trying to figure out who's lying who's not is still so core to the experience yes. like there was at one point we were voting on people and i was a good person so i'm not trying to throw somebody off and i said i think steve is one of the evil players i don't have any information through like the game mechanics that points me to that but i'm watching him play and i think he's playing like uh somebody who's on the evil team and that ended up being right and that made me happy that you know that is still a core part of this game i think the biggest downside to this game is that it's just fiddly to talk about our experience we had two false starts where somebody fundamentally misunderstood or misheard a rule i think the first time we were doing roles somebody couldn't see the moderator when the moderator was giving them their information so had basically no choice but to say i'm so sorry <laughs> like i don't know you know you're, you're giving me this information but we kind of have to restart and then the second time so I, I don't remember but something happened again where we had to restart and the problem with that in this game is it's not like in the resistance where it says deal cards okay let's play it was like everybody has to pick out a role everybody has to give the role back to the moderator the moderator has to like position them so that he knows who is each role so you know we're talking like i don't know 10 minutes would you say to get it set up each time uh and then the third play we had also had a big asterisk and this is kind of funny uh the moderator accidentally gave false information to our fortune teller leading him to believe that one person could not have been the evil person even though they were and what had happened was that he was you get this big grimoire book that is where you put the roles in and he was walking around in the circle and not recognizing the fact that as he would rotate around the circle he was changing the orientation of the book uh which caused him to i guess give false information so our place kind of had this big asterisk on it which to me points out just how delicate easy for for things to go wrong this game is but even despite that i still had more fun with this game than i expected i would absolutely if, if somebody was you know an experienced host hosting 
a blood on the clock tower games like i'm gonna run this we're gonna play two or three games of this in the evening i would sign up for that experience Absolutely. And I think I'll just add to that two more things that I really admire about the game. One, there is elimination, like if you're playing a game of Mafia. But the neat thing about that is that the players who are eliminated become ghosts who can still listen to the conversation and they get to vote one time. So they can jump in at a a pivotal moment and still participate in the game, which was very interesting and novel and felt like a meaningful decision for them about when is the most pivotal moment for me to use my vote. The other thing is all these roles, you know, some of them are going to appear in in the games and some aren't. And I think they create these real agencies, they're real tools for players to use uh, that made it really interesting. My role, I knew uh, that a specific evil role was in the game and I knew one of two characters who was that role, which changed my whole perspective on the game and made me have to solve the puzzle of when to come forward with that information and and how to do that and i had a lot of fun with it so i absolutely would love to play blood on the clock tower again it's not my favorite social deduction game uh but i'd like to keep playing it all right well i think that's our experience with blood on the clock tower hopefully that gives you some sense on if it would be a good game for you brendan what do you say we jump down to the next big player count game that we played which was Guards of Atlantis 2. Yeah, let's do it. Jake, do you want to give the overview or do you want me to? I can give the overview, but jump in when I don't say the important stuff. (laughs) So (laughs) Guards of Atlantis 2 is an abstracted MOBA game, which MOBA is like... uh, Dota 2, League of Legends, a series of computer games, right? Here's Yeah, what is it? What's the M? Multiplayer Online Battle Arena. Yeah, I knew the Online Battle Arena part. So... Essentially, the way Guards of Atlantis works is it's a team game. Uh, We played three on three. I think you could also play five on five or two on two. And everybody plays as one hero. And you're essentially trying to win in a couple of different ways by either killing the opponent enemy heroes enough. Every time somebody gets killed, they respawn in their home base. And the they essentially the team where the hero got killed loses some life points and you have five life points to start heroes give a variable amount of life uh, depending on their level Uh, the other way you can win the game is by slaying these minions that start in the middle of the board Uh, when when you um, you can kill a minion essentially with one hit uh, and whoever kills the minions that they're trying to kill first means that all the minions will get swept off the board and respawn closer to the enemy's base. Um, if you slay all the minions again, then in when they're in the close to the enemy base, then you'll win as the minions get pushed into the base. Or the game ends after in the third, I think like the third round of the game, the third minion push of the game uh, in the sort of abbreviated version that we played. I think there's like kind of a short or a long version of Guardians of Atlantis. Whoever wins that final push wins the game. Um, I'll add a couple of things. Yes. Okay. Uh, One, there's a simultaneous reveal mechanism. So the game is sort of played in rounds. Uh, Within these pushes, there's like four actions that you'll take. So you get all of your cards and then you pick a card everyone simultaneously picks a card reveals them you resolve that and you do that four times as your hand and options wane down uh and you resolve them in initiative order based on the card kind of getting into the weeds a little bit but there's this really interesting simultaneous reveal that's happening over and over again in the game as you're getting more and more information about what your opponents might be able to do and what they might want to do so that creates very interesting uh a sort of I know that you know type situations that are fun uh, donkey space problems to solve. And then also, I would say, Jake, one thing that really impressed me about Guards of Atlantis 2, right? MOBAs are known for being system rich computer games that take months, if not years of people's lives to really learn how to play. And that's a tricky thing to try to adapt to tabletop. If you abstract it too much, it's going to reflect or resemble nothing like it's the games that inspired it. And if you don't abstract enough, it's going to take way too long and not be of interest to the not be of interest as a sort of port in this new play space. I would say the the real thing about Guards of Atlantis 2 that's so awesome is it strikes that balance perfectly. It feels totally exactly agree. like a MOBA and exactly like a board game version of a MOBA while being really accessible. Yeah, you've played MOBAs. You have more MOBA experience than me. I've played League of Legends like a handful of times. Um, and 
I felt like I got the nods to the genre, even with that limited experience. But the thing that made me not excited to try this game was that I just expected it to be way too much of a simulation. I expected like a rules dense, highly complex game experience. And I didn't find that at all. I found really a game that I would say the the systems and mechanisms are very elegant. Yeah, it there's there's really interesting decisions and trade-offs as well. With a big thing about MOBAs is you're you're choosing a build for your character. So you're you're picking items and you're picking uh, abilities in certain orders typically as your character levels up. And Guards of Atlantis has this neat system where you have a a set of cards that you start with and then as you accomplish things within the game, you're getting money that you can spend towards upgrades and you have our are you're choosing certain cards to add into your deck, cards to remove. Um, and there's there's different options in how you might do that in terms of both the actions and the cards that you have and the passive benefits that you might get in terms of damage you can do, movement, that sort of thing. So yeah. I felt like there were really robust planning decisions in this game and really interesting tactical decisions because of the si- simultaneous reveal. But the best design decision in Guards of Atlantis 2 by far, in my opinion, is that once the round starts, once cards get flipped, teammates cannot speak to each other and inform their decisions. So it's kind of with that late communication restriction, simulating a real time game because you can all kind of talk and make a plan, cards get revealed, and then it's up to each player on the team to make a decision that they hope is best, uh, not knowing maybe exactly what their their teammates would like you to do, which is cool. It felt it kept the game moving, but it also it felt like a team game in that sense. And we couldn't just sit there and AP solve the game together. We just had to be confident, make a choice and and live with it. Yeah, cool. I really like that too. And you could you can discuss all you want in the planning phase where everyone's deciding which card they're going to play. But if you're like, hey, we're going to all go attack Brendan. Now, Brendan knows that and he could choose a card that maybe allows him to run away or keep a really high defense card back in his hand. Whereas, you know, maybe you just look at your teammate and raise your eyebrow and you're hoping, let's both go attack Brendan, you know. Um, so I thought that was really cool. And also, again, it's sort of something that simulates the games a little bit, I assume, in that you have a cool play lined up, but your opponent, your your, your teammate is just like moved right in front of where you were planning to move. Uh, and now you're all of a sudden scrambling to to find something else to do with that card you play yeah the experience of a planned team fight falling apart is like classic moba experience and i would say it plays out here it just everything about this extracts all the systems but provides all the feel of playing a moba in the best way there's lots of you can make smart decisions and plan for what's to come but that could go wrong it's just i can't say enough for me this was the perfect large group convention game because it's really unlikely I'll get the chance to play this regularly in my day-to-day gaming. So it's not a game I felt compelled to then go back on Kickstarter, but it, I will, or on GameFound, it's active right now. I think if you're still listening to, the, if you're listening to this episode on release day, it would be there. Maybe not. It might have changed. I have no idea. But I will say this is one of the only games Jake and I played twice at the convention. We played it back to back. Uh, and I think that that speaks to the fact that Jake and I felt like it was a really good use of our time. We stayed until the wee hours of the morning having a blast playing this. Yeah. Um, the second game was also, I think, much better clicked. than the first game. It, yeah, again, it was sort of a cl- click. Like the, the first game, maybe as you would want or expect, um, the team I was playing on was all new players. The team Brendan was on was the player who had the most experience by far of anyone in the game. The the uh, Charlie, who, who he owned we the played game. on his copy, uh, and they slaughtered us in the first round. And then the second round, we had a really fun competitive game where it felt like, okay, now we're really playing this game. There are some weird things about this game that I think, like Blood on the Clock Tower, uh, this is a kind of a delicate game where you have to strike the magic circle just right. Um, I think the communication rules is like a good example of this. Like it would be so easy for a team who had played this multiple times to like, hey, if I wink, that means like we're attacking together. You know Mm, what I mean? Something like that. And even something as slight as that, which could even just come up naturally if you're in game two or three playing with the same people could really, I think, hamper the game experience. The other thing that's weird is players 
characters can do drastically different things. So you might go to attack a person and they have a card that's like, if you get attacked, cancel it. and Or, you know, if you get attacked by range, cancel it. And then the attacker has to like discard their card. Um, and a lot of those cards that would come out just kind of felt like a little bit anticlimactic, right? If you're positioning yourself, you've got your good attack ready to go. Uh, and then it's just kind of like, well, I didn't know that they could do that. Yeah. Uh, so that felt weird. But at the same time, I don't think the game would work at all if players were operating from perfect information of the cards in their opponent's hand. Uh, so it was just weird, right? It's like you want to know a little bit what your opposing enemies might be capable of, but you don't want players to be able to know exactly what they could do, right? Because the way the attacking works, I attack with damage six, then my opponent has to discard a card with block six or more or else they die. Uh, so if you just knew what blocking somebody was capable of all of a sudden the game is a lot less interesting and it becomes less a question of like do i take this risk and more of like a calculation of all attack here and then they die for sure and that's not nearly as exciting as the way we were playing it though the way we were playing it left just led to some kind of feel bad anticlimactic moments and then on top of that then i think the for people who have played it more it becomes what card are they going to play this round uh one of the great design decisions about this game is that it's really it's really rewarding when a hero, which the characters you play, t- to be able to just kill one of the other characters on the other team, they'll respond, they go back, they can get back in the game, but it gives your team a big benefit. And you want that big benefit because it will accelerate you in the game. But one of the best design decisions is it's very difficult to do that on your own. Heroes are fairly durable, but if two people team up, all of a sudden it becomes much more likely with any given push that you could kill a teammate. And then it becomes a question of opportunity cost around, is that better to do or is it better to focus on uh, taking these minions off the board and getting the push to go in our direction? So there's a lot of good good stuff going on here that's really interesting. And it shows why people love and admire this game so much because the design really is durable enough to support uh, interesting and meaningful decisions. Yeah, I, it's like a game you wish you had at an earlier part of your life, right? If I had this like us, in high yeah. school or undergrad, uh, and I could just you know had a core group of people and just like play this for Friday hours nights. and really like yep. learn it and stuff, that would be so fun. Uh, and it also, like, there are so many heroes in the game that as soon as things start becoming too familiar, as, as somebody mentioned this in the Discord, you just switch, right? Now, all of a sudden, yeah. you're playing a different combination of heroes or different heroes entirely to kind of make sure you're maintaining that delicate magic circle that the game sort of demands that you're playing in. Um, and the last kind of really positive thing I'll say about this, the design aspect that impressed me the most which i think just speaks to the really good development work that's been done with this game is that the characters that you're playing as are one hit to kill them so when you're playing the game you feel so scared that you could die Mm. at any moment because of how squishy you are but at the same time as we're sort of already talking about the actual of like trying to take on and kill an a enemy character it feels so daunting so the fact that you have both that is like it's so hard to kill people in this game but also like i'm terrified at all times because i'm so easy to kill it's It's just phenomenal it's working like magic i mean that's just a huge testament to this design yeah so i'd play this game anytime i would play it again absolutely Uh, i'm with you i'm not gonna buy it because fortunately charlie has it he's in my monday night game group but i would say my position on this game went from fine i'll play if that's what's happening at the con to you know next time charlie wants to host a night for this game i'm 100 percent in last thing we played the short version of the game that's the version i want to play i don't think i have any interest in playing the five round version of this game the three round that felt just right yeah we saw six heroes uh there was a swap between and they're all really interesting and felt like moba characters enough that i could m- recognize the archetypes but they didn't feel derivative which i thought was really neat as well so yeah. I-, I would say you know as close as we ever get to a decision space recommends guards of atlantis 2 gets it yeah for and sure we'll probably just say that again in a few minutes while jake and i talk about this next game which is our play of the con yes <laughs> All building to this, Challengers. Do you mind if I do the overview on this one, Jake? Yeah, because I blew the last one so You didn't much. blow it at all. You did a great <laughs> yeah. job. Oh, thanks. Uh, so Challengers is, is really interesting. It's a light 
deck building card game in which you're going to build your deck over the course of eight rounds. It's a game that supports uh, low player, player counts, but I wouldn't want to play this with less than four, and it supports up to eight. It's played over eight rounds in which you have a head-to-head -head battle against another player with your personal deck. You all start with the same deck, and at the end of every round, you're going to draw new cards from one of three decks based on the round that it is to enhance your cards. Uh, the cards all feed into these different strategic archetypes, and you're looking for cards that synergize together to try to win these battles. So you have lots of planning decisions in how you put together your deck. Then within each of those battles, uh, you're literally moving around the table, sitting down at a little station and playing an assigned match. There's a nifty system that works very well to do that easily and quickly. Uh, and you get an increasing number of points when you win each given round sort of throughout. So the first round, you just get a few points. And by the end, you're getting heaps of points for winning your matchup. Uh, when you have that matchup, you're essentially playing war. You're flipping cards off the top of your deck, uh, trying to beat the value that your opponent has in front of them with multiple cards. Then uh, once you do, you leave the last card that you had uh, placed down. That becomes your active card that your opponent is trying to respond to. There's some little uh, resolution rules around this cool mechanism about losing too many different types of cards or, or running out of your deck. So you're looking for multiples. Uh, and there's some fun decisions, little decisions you can make within that resolution. Sometimes. But sometimes. My, my deck didn't have any decisions. Okay. <laughs> and my deck had a few where I was manipulating the order of my deck, which I had built into because I thought it might be a strong archetype to go towards. Yeah. So, I mean, this game was so much fun. We played at the full eight player count. So we had a whole eight player tournament and it just does such a good job of simulating a turn, like a card game tournament feel in a literal gateway, even lighter, you know, like this could be the first board game so many plays in their lives like it's that simple to play and teach um plays in under an hour plays in under hour. yeah i definitely under an hour i mean i think our game with eight people everybody learning it tear down and 45? everything 45 minutes yeah um so cool i mean it it did such a good job simulating it that after a game i've almost felt like i should be going up to the wall somewhere to looking at like the table pairings to yeah. see like where yeah. I should go, which is handled differently in the game. Um, but, you know, it was interesting playing this right before Millennium Blades, which thematically are doing such similar things. Uh, but man, this one was the card game tournament simulation for me. There's a, it's all simultaneous play. So the game has this really impressive energy as you sort of zoom through this match. Everyone stayed mostly synced up too. So if you finish a little bit early, you end up drawing your new cards that you're going to augment your deck with and make decisions there. Going into challengers, Jake, I was a little bit nervous that the deck building decisions might not be very interesting or robust. And I actually found that the system did a really good job of presenting me with a few different paths I might be able to pursue. And having played card games in the past, I felt like I was able to make interesting decisions that really affected my ability to pursue in the tournament. I ended up getting second. Um, so I might just feel that way from a validation bias, confirmation bias somewhat. Um, but after one play, I felt my decisions of deck building were part were a huge part of why I won. Uh, luck matters in this game, and I think it should because of the nature of the game. You want it people to be mostly competitive throughout to have fairly even rounds but I, I really i was impressed by how much i felt when i was drafting i was presented with some good options uh tough choices and that those choices within the meta i perceived kind of paid off everything you every aspect of this game is just super fun and exactly the like weight that you want the deck building is literally you just draw five cards pick one or two of them you can discard the remaining cards to redraw that many so if i i'll take one discard this other four draw four new ones take one more that's it uh then at, after that you can choose to get rid of any cards that you currently have in your deck to try and you know uh get into a more streamlined strategy or something so the deck building being that simple and streamlined you don't need more than a couple of minutes max to do that each round and it's so fun to see the cards you get by the third or fourth round when i was pulling cards out of the deck there were things even in this very first play i was hoping to see uh which is i think really impressive that you feel like you can be like 
right? Like what you said, perceiving a meta, building towards specific strategies within that very first play, having zero clue what could possibly exist in the card pool. And still we ended up with archetypes and different viable strategies um, playing out throughout the game. The other when, thing that was super fun is the actual war. I, I had no decisions at all in my deck. I was just flipping over cards to see what won. But my deck had a lot of things where the order of the cards really mattered. So I had some powerful benefits by cards being on my bench. So after they're defeated, uh, they're powering up certain other cards in my deck. And then I had powerful effects for if this character is holding the flag it gets some benefit so i had cards that i really wanted to be the one that ultimately overtook my opponent's card to to claim the flag so my deck was just like even though i had no decisions in it, it the power level of my deck was insanely variable where i could get i lost to jared who sadly only won a single game he beat me and then in the last round i beat the person who ended up winning the tournament like my deck was just like either on or off and that was so fun to see play out in these games play out in 90 seconds maybe yeah it's quick i think another cool thing about this game jake is in large group games in general as we try to sort of bring things together is i think one thing that i loved about challengers uh was when i'm here sort of playing my match i'm in that mode but i know lots of other things are happening around me and that gives the game a sense of energy and it makes the game feel even bigger than it might be when i finished i I loved jumping up and sort of seeing what was going on in other matches trying to get a sense for what decks people might be playing and i thought that that was really cool and it's something that large group games can accomplish when we're all experiencing a game separately it gives you this perception of the game being even bigger than it actually is for you in your small space and It's hard to get that in board games where we all typically are sharing one space and playing in one game, whereas you do get it in something like a card game tournament. To see that feeling brought into an actual game and a magic circle was was really special. And I I, I amazed that Challengers does it in a time that's like you could play it three or four times in a night. Yeah, it it's it's a party game. Yeah, it's a party game. You know, and I'm I know this doesn't fit with everybody who's listening to this podcast but i feel like personally starved for games that i can play at seven or eight players it when i i have a core like you know board game enthusiast group now that meets and we have you know a solid four or five people every week but if i'm hosting a game night and i kind of put out the call to my larger group of friends who i know you know like games or not i feel like i end up with one person coming over or like seven every time and seven is such a pain because especially if they're not like board game enthusiast type people you're not gonna like split into two groups that's just not happening so i love having high player count games available to me and this is one that feels unlike any other party game that i've ever played you know it's a party game that feels like i'm going to a magic the gathering tournament but a party game version of that and i mean that's just such a cool theme it's just such a fun forward gaming experience that i you know rushed out and picked up a copy of this uh as well and then uh i was happy to see it on the kenner spiel list which we just got announced too as the expert board game of the year that breaks my brain a little bit i don't know how this can kind of fit into the more advanced category it feels as or light accessible. as any as light as accessible as basically any game i've played this year but i hope it wins because i think it is deserving it's... um don't go into this game thinking like this is a really tactical experience it's not it's actually purely strategic almost um the decisions are fun, but it's not incredibly meaty. There's a lot of randomness in this. Go into this thinking that I'm playing a party game, and I think you're in for just an excellent time, especially if you can get the higher player count experience with it. Yep. Um, yeah. oh, can I say one more thing about it? Please. This was I, I love this. Uh, a- after our game, Carcassonne Hater in our Discord ended up winning, and he was playing a clown strategy. And clowns are like, these cards that help you to get points. Normally you only get points by winning the game, but the, with oh, the clown winning cards, a match. winning a match, but the clown cards allowed for getting, gaining point. They were basically weaker cards, but if they did manage to win the flag would give you immediate points. So he was accruing points throughout the whole tournament. And we, and he ended up winning the tournament and we were kind of going to lunch afterwards. And we're thinking like, that was the best experience. It was so much fun. The only thing that would be bad is if that clown strategy turns out to be like over centralized or overpowered. 
Um, and then later I was talking to my friend Kevin who had played a couple times with different groups and he's like, yeah, we're just loving challengers. It's so much fun. The only problem is there's a dominant strategies and a strategy. And I was like, what is it fully expecting him to say clowns? He's like, it's just getting like all the big creatures. And I was like, oh, great. This is perfect. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's like totally. And I think that, you know, one cool thing about the way that the deck is set up and the drafting is that uh, even if there was a, a set that was stronger you still have to draw into it and that means yeah. that every game player is going to have to make smart drafting decisions uh like all drafting games staying open and uh it was really fun building your deck knowing when to prune weaker cards because there's an advantage to having a bigger deck but if you have a smaller deck you're going to draw your better cards so i was smitten with the decisions i want to play it more i'm glad jake has a copy but jealous that he lives in st louis with that copy that was our kind of three bigger games that we played. Uh, we kind of got into this conversation a little bit already, but large group games overall, what are our sort of final about them? I think that one really cool thing about large group games, Jake, is just that there's more texture and more room for exploring decisions around communication and sharing information. All of the games we talked about today, Blood on the Clock, or two of them, Blood on the Clock Tower and Guards of Atlantis do that. Let's say Challengers even has a little bit of that with like not knowing what decks people are playing, which is kind of cool. It's so They're, unique in the large group game experience. It like is. That's part of the it's reason it's unique. awesome, but it's going to break a lot of these rules, rules. for this conversation. Yeah. I, it reminded me of another game that I like playing in large groups, just one, not Challengers ex specifically, but just this information sharing communication area of large group games. I think it's a space that these games can move into and if they're thoughtful about how they allow for and restrict communication you can end up with really rich interactions so if i was sort of tasked with designing a large group game i would think a lot about communication and the flow of information because it's really rich and you can create pockets of privileged information and, and unprivileged information and people who have inside knowledge in a way that can create this pretty vivacious experience for players yeah i think another aspect that's really fun to explore not just the sharing the experience with like more people, which is which is obviously awesome, um, but the fact that you can really have special player powers thrive. And I know we're not always huge on um, like crazy amounts of uh, asymmetric player powers. Often they they make games more difficult to learn or higher barrier to entry or higher skill floor. Um, but I think when done right they can really create fun experiences uh in you know blood of the clock tower guards of atlantis zuvatis which we didn't include in this conversation though that plays up to seven players and, and we played it at seven are all examples of games where you get to be the the one person that can do this uh special thing so you kind of get moments to shine and everybody's like you're the person like holding holding up the game is like everybody has to like pay attention to me because like this is my thing and it's happening now and that's a really fun experience um that happens in all in smaller player count games too but it's even more exciting when you're holding court in in zuvatis and you're like who wants to use my tunnels you know yeah. i will be taking bids now and only now make your best offer that type of thing we've talked in the past too jake about playing games in teams uh, and I think that one thing about large group games is it naturally sort of encourages team play. I find playing games with other people where we get to discuss the decisions to be a really enjoyable experience. Um, I don't think that should be surprising to anyone since I spend a large portion of my time talking with Jake about decisions and games that I would like to play games where I can discuss decisions we might make together with each other. Uh, but I think it's fun when, when you're a really big group having different teams that you're working towards, it can lend the decisions you're making more weight because you're you're not just potentially letting yourself down, you're potentially letting other people down or winning for other people. Uh, and that can be really fun and kind of amp up the social dynamics in a fun way. These are kind of obvious things, but it feels notable to remark on them just because at Geekway, it was so fun getting to play like in Guards of Atlantis 2 and knowing when I made a decision, I didn't want to let my team down, you know? Yeah, and it's rare, rarer for us to get these type of games to the table, which makes, you know, a convention setting a, a perfect place for it. And I think one of my takeaways was just how after playing quite a few of these games is just how variable the experience is. You know, Challengers feels so different from Blood on the Clock Tower, yeah. uh, which felt very different from Zuvatis, which felt very different from Guards of Atlantis. Um, and I guess that's also possibly a 
obvious takeaway, but I think we're in a space in our hobby now where, you know, an eight player game can be a quick, fun filler, uh, or it could be a long social deduction game, you know, and it's crazy the amount of variability that exists there. Uh, and I, you know, would encourage people to explore because it really does change the decision space and the dynamic when you're in a larger group setting. And I think my final thing is one thing I love about group games, I mentioned this in Challenger Shake, that because you're all kind of playing in your own space, it means your experience of the day- game is different than those of than people around you. Sidereal, I know, Sidereal Confluence is another game that kind of ends up in this space where lots of game is happening all around and you're just trying to be in as much of the game as you can. And I think that that's cool because after the play, not everyone experienced the same thing, which means you can talk about it and discuss your different experiences of the exact same game and bring this different perspective. Um, and it's a unique aspect, I, I think, of large group games. You can all participate in the same game, but have dramatically different experiences of it because either you had different information or because you were just playing in a different part of the game. So you didn't see something that happened across the table. And, and those sort of revelations create this energy and buzz that can extend to even after the play of the game. Awesome. Well, we went a little bit long, but I think that brings us to the end of this week's episode, recapping Geekway, talking about large group games. Obviously, we talk, played a way more games, which we gave our very brief review on that will be the opportunity to talk more about in the future. Uh, Brendan, thanks so much for coming to St. Louis. Thank you to everyone who attended Geekway, both inside our group and outside of it. Thank you to our patrons for making that possible uh thanks you know so much thanks to our patrons for making that possible uh if you want to join our patrons we do have a patreon page at patreon.com slash decision space uh you can also help our show by leaving us a review but until next time thank you so much for listening to decision space we'll end as always by thanking hembry for our intro and outro music and until next week say goodbye y'all bye